Hi and welcome to 3D Mutiny. My name is Vertis. I'm a creature and character artist in the games industry with a vast experience in creating 3D hair cards for games. In this video, I'm going to show you how to create hair cards from scratch. We'll be making them in ZBrush, uh, positioning them in Maya and baking them out in Substance Designer. I'll be sharing my tips and tricks on how to 2D concept the hair cards to your advantage, create the 3D geometry of the hair itself, render out pixel perfect textures and then place and position those in something like Maya so you can put them on your character and have it in a, a real-time scene. So in my career I've used almost every form of creating hair cards under the sun. Um, as an art director I've talked to plugin managers and made workflows between characterized for creating things like creatures that have a lot of fur. Um, in my time as a lecturer I've also tried to discover a way to communicate to students how to create hair cards which isn't so convoluted. So I came up with this system and funnily enough I found it to be better than the longer processes and it is now something I use personally uh, in my own industry work um, and I thought I'd share it with you guys for free. So if you dream to become a professional character artist and create high quality hair cards which is fundamental when it comes to your employment as a character artist be sure to watch this video in its fullest and subscribe for more free content like this. So come join us on the 3D Mutiny and let's get started. Fundamentally, what you want to focus on is the generation of the textures themselves. So the target is we're trying to create a, a 2D map of hair strands that can be used on a 3D character and then be outputted in, in a way that they render quite nicely in 3D space. So there's a million and one ways to actually generate these hair cards. So for example, one of the first ways you can do it is through XGEM. And XGEM, it requires you to basically set up a scene like this and uh, render out almost like CG hair and then collect a lot of map data, things like um, alphas, roots and depths. And then those can be fed into different shaders. So for example, uh, a shader artist will use those in Unreal Engine to create um, different effects of the hair and different shines. Um, and the, but there are also different ways of doing it. So fundamentally, if you can create an array of geometry, you know, it has different hair strands, you can still bake maps out of that, alpha maps and normal maps, and hook those into different things. So that could be used in Unreal or Marmoset. Obviously, this one is a bit more convoluted, a larger, larger learning curve. They all have different plugins, which can get quite complicated. So if you're getting seasoned, uh, you might want to look into these. But even that, even saying that when I'm in production, I prefer to use this um, ZBrush method. So before rendering any hair cards or drawing out any planes, I like to get a reference and basically break it down into its core components. So usually we'll be working with about three different types of hair strand, uh, an initial layer, second layer, and a flyaway layer. So I'm gonna use the pen to break down and get a better understanding of how this hair flow is working out and what sort of um, densities and negative space I'm gonna have to put into it. So I'm just gonna do that now. So while this video plays out, I'd love for you guys to scroll down and join our Discord channel where people have started to make suggestions for new videos and also talk about the games industry. If you need any help on this video, that's probably the best place to catch me. Cool, so how I've broken it down here, um, I've identified the initial layer. So the first layer is going to be very bulky. You won't be able to see through it. It's used for blocking out 3D shapes and covering things like the skull. Uh, we have... A secondary layer so this is where the hair sort of opens up a little bit more it's got some more negative space gaps that you can see through um, so that gives a nice illusion of depth when you're looking at a, a character from a distance and i can see that there's uh, a third layer here which i'd call sort of flyaways which is more detail and that's used for uh, blending everything back together very transparent um, and used for getting the hair silhouettes back onto the background and making sure you can't see the, basically up the sides of cards I've also broken down uh, the tips of the hair because that's going to be important for silhouettes. So when I do draw out those hair cards, uh, what the tip's going to look like. So there's going to be a little bit of clumping, sort of like this V shape that I can make use of. Uh, maybe one that opens up a little bit more and potentially one that is sort of like stray ends to make it look more organic. Uh, and then also just observations of how the hair cards are going to be moving. So we've got a lot of twisting that's going on here. And how am I going to use that? Am I going to do that in the texture or am I going to do that in the 3D object? Um, so the answer to that is you're going to do it in the 3D object and keep all the hair strands straight. Next, I want to continue with that strategy. So I'm going to break this texture into three separate parts, um, the base layer, the secondary layer, and then the flyaways. 
and then we're going to draw hair within that as a 2D concept. Take that into something like ZBrush and then draw on top of it so we don't have to fiddle around so much. So it's a really good idea to do a concept initially first with your planes and then you can do things like test them out, make sure they overlap nicely um, or just test to see how they're functioning in 3D space, which is really useful. So it's easier to fill fast on paper instead of doing it in 3D and just taking up too much time. So here what I've done, I've basically used the rectangle tool on a new layer and then drawn out some UV spaces which are going to contain all the hair. Um, and I've got all this blank space for basically additional parts of the hair, whether it's sort of blending it at the front or maybe the sideburns are quite unique and won't be using that long hair. For the next layer, I'm going to get a green or white brush and basically draw those strands of hair. They don't have to be perfect. I'm just looking for block out and negative space, basically. So what I've done here is really focused on colouring in a lot of spaces, making sure they're not holes. There are a couple of areas where there's uh, negative see-through spaces, which can be interesting. And I've also tried to replicate the tips of the hair that I did in the reference. So I'd consider this first one sort of like the 100% hair used for blocking out. And then the next one's going to be about half of that, so slightly transparent. Uh, and then the third one's going to be very thin, just used for the silhouettes of flyaways. So I'm going to finish that up. So obviously, obviously we're just going to use this um, for concepting purposes. It doesn't have to be neat as long as we can sort of follow those guides. On the second layer, what I was focusing on was uh, because the hair is a lot thinner, it's going to open out a lot more. So it's going to be less straight. So we're going to have some open zones around here. And again, just focusing on the tips. Those are going to be super important. Uh, and just making use of all the 2D space because we're using a texture. We want to make use of all the pixels on there. So really push it up to the corners. Um, and get the most out of the texture that you can. And so the next piece I'm going to do is the, the flyovers, which are going to be a bit more straggly. Now at this stage, you don't want to make anything that's too unique because when you replicate that, that's going to be very obvious to the human eye. So areas like this are okay, but uh, if you imagine seeing that multiple times, it's going to be very obvious that it's duplicated. So try and make all the strands as generic as possible. And then in 3D, we can make them basically unique. So now I'm going to export this texture. It might be an idea to you add an adjustment layer like a brightness and just bring that down so it's easier to draw on top of and it won't sort of like blast out your eyes. Going to go up to File, Quick Export as PNG. Find a location and call this uh, 2D Concept. Now in Maya, I'm going to add a 2D plane and it's going to act as the foundation for baking all the map and geometry onto to generate our hair textures. So I'm going to come up to 2D plane, going to increase the size of this just so I can see it to the settings polyplane one. I'm going to turn the subdivisions down to one on each side, then going to export this piece of geometry. So export selection as an FBX. So in ZBrush, we're going to import that 2D plane and then attach that 2D texture reference to it. Come to Z plugins, dock it. FBX selected, that's fine, uh, the 2020 version and import. Navigate to your low poly plate. To add a texture, I'm going to scroll down on the right side and open texture maps. Uh, click new texture and then we can click on this white transparent piece. Go to import and select your texture. As you can see, the orientation is upside down. So we want to come into texture, dock it um, and re-import this texture. Once it's in ZBrush, you can select it and then just down here, you've got flip vertically and that's going to flip it upside down. And then when we reassign it to this geometry, it's going to flip itself. So select the texture map and just re-click it and then it should update. And now we've got the texture the correct way up. So now we're going to use a tubes brush to draw individual strands of hair and then make use of uh, duplication and the move tool to basically create the thickness of the hair and replicate that onto each strand. So to do that, I'm going to come to uh, the sub tool and duplicate it. And then I'm just going to make sure that one of the textures is off. So this first plate is going to be used for drawing on and the one on top is going to be used as the visual reference. I'm going to take the visual reference and basically nudge this up ever so slightly so they're not intersecting. Next, I'm going to select the lower plate or I would call the drawing plate. 
and change the brush to something like a, a curved tubes, making sure not to use curved multi-tube because it doesn't have as much functionality. So with curved tubes, you can draw out individual strands of hair and there's a couple of settings that you can change to make it a little bit easier. Uh, definitely change the draw size so you get a thinner, thinner hair, but fundamentally you can edit this all at the end. If you come into strokes and dock this, you're going to have uh, the lazy mouse, which is going to make your drawing a lot smoother. So a lot of more curved hair. And you're also going to have the curve modifiers. And as default, that's off. But if you turn it on, you can change the taper. So how thick and thin the hair gets um, from thickness right down to the tip. I wouldn't go really small because hair doesn't act like that. Um, sometimes like eyebrows and eyelashes will because they're new pieces of hair. But if you go to a hairdresser's, uh, your hair is going to be the same size all the way down pretty much. So with those settings set, basically I'm going to come anywhere on the plate and start to draw full lengths of hair. doesn't matter where they are so far. Um, we're just going to move them afterwards with the move brush. So I'm going to draw about four out. Next, I want to separate the back plate from the hair itself. It means that we can duplicate the hair a couple of times and manipulate it. So with draw selected, I'm just going to solo isolate this and control and shift and click the back plate. What this will do is it will select it and isolate it. And then with control click on the outside, I can mask this. Now with control shift click on the outside again, I can bring everything back. So now we've got a masked background. Uh, I can come down to split and then split by mask points. And now we've got two sub tools, which is the, the back plate and the hair itself. With that complete, I want to split these individual hair strands into poly groups. So they're a bit more manageable. Uh, if I scroll down to poly groups, I can go to auto group and then that's going to put them into different poly groups. If I press shift F, it's going to preview that. Now, if I zoom in, you get given this wireframe. Now you can actually turn that off if you hover over the poly draw poly frame button. Uh, top left, there's just like a, a little line highlight. You can click that. It's going to turn it off and then you're just left with the color itself, which is quite useful. Now at this stage, I can control click uh, an individual poly group uh, and then start to move that independently. So I'm just going to move them roughly on top of the concept we did and repeat that for all of them. Once they're correctly in the bounds of this UV space, I can use a brush called Move Topological. And what that's going to do is basically move the geometry based on the topology. Whereas uh, a normal move brush would move everything at once. We can just move each individual strand. So the target is to kind of follow the 2D concept, focus on the uh, negative space that we did and make sure that the tips are all right. Uh, and then after that, I'm going to use duplication to make many, many, many forms and then exponentially increase the amount of hair. Once you've got something basic like that, uh, I like to duplicate this and then just bring it off to the side maybe make some more edits, potentially rotate it and then put it back over the original. And then it's going to start to layer up loads of different forms of hair. Okay, that's a good foundation. Um, I'm just making sure that they're not intersecting, which is going to become a harder task as you go along. Um, you could quite easily use something like that as a 50% coverage hair but I'm just going to thicken it up by using duplication and more movements. I'm not going to spend too long on that, but um, once you finish, what I do is I come to merge and then basically merge down multiple times just to connect them all. Uh, and then potentially you want to go to poly groups and then re auto group these. Um, now, at this point, I just zoom in and just fix up any areas that are overlapping. Again, I'm, for the demo purposes, I'm not going to do that. Uh, another useful thing you can do is if you hold uh, control and shift with selection rectangle, obviously that's going to isolate certain areas. But if you combine that with uh, control shift and A, you can actually select individual strands. Um, so that can be quite useful. For example, I could hold control now, fill that as a mask and then hold control shift to bring everything back um, and then split these up how I see fit. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna split this and then make use of one of these for the 50% and then do a couple of edits just to save time. So here I've split it. I'm gonna find uh, the piece that I wanted, which I think is this one. And then I'm gonna duplicate it and then bring it to the side. 
um, bring back the original concept, just see that it's overlapping correctly. And then I'm going to adjust it to fit that concept. The benefit with this workflow is you can really uh, match something almost to the pixel of your concept if you really want. Um, but when I'm doing it, I don't sweat it as long as it's kind of accurate. But it does uh, afford you that feature that you can basically be super, super accurate with it. Okay, now I'm going to do exactly the same stuff that we've been doing, but this time with the flyaways. Now we want to export each one of these high poly hairs individually. So make sure that they're all merged into their components. And then I'm going to export as FBX uh, per unit. So to do that, once again, in Z plugins, going to dock it to the side, FBX export and import. I'm making sure that I have selected on, on the selected subtool uh, and then export. So now we want to bake our hair and extract all that baking information onto that original plate. I like to use uh, Substance Designer. It's got lots of different mesh maps. Uh, in Substance Painter, you don't get things like opacity at the time of making this. So we're going to go to File, New, New Substance Graph, Metallic Roughness, and for the time being, just use 2048. I suggest going a little bit higher because you can always downsize it later. Now over to the left, I'm going to right click the unsaved package. And then I'm instead of importing, I'm going to link some objects. So under Link and the 3D Scene. Select the high polys and also the low poly plate. Now for the baking process, I'm going to right click the low poly plate and bake model information. It's going to bring up uh, an intimidating window, but what we're going to do is add the high definition meshes. So select all the hair. I want to make sure that I'm doing it from resource. So if I'm going to re-export some hair, maybe make some edits, it's going to update across the chain and then I can rebake things. So we've got our three sections selected there. Going over a couple of settings, um, for the time being, I'm going to use 2K PNG is totally fine. I'm going to turn off anti-aliasing just so it's a bit faster. And then in terms of baked renders, I want to have uh, ambient occlusion from mesh map. So it's going to bake down the AO from the hair and then do the same with the normal map from mesh and also the opacity, which is going to cut, cut the hair cards out. You also want to make sure that you've got an output destination. So under output, uh, select a file. I'm going to do a test render here and see what happens. So after starting the render, I can see there's a couple of artifacts here. Uh, the best way to basically pre preview them is in the opacity map. So what we're looking for is white strands of hair. Um, what we have to do is increase the front value and the rear value here. And it's basically how far the system's looking for high poly models. Right now it's falling a bit short and cutting through the model. So just increase that size. Now we have a set of textures that are ready to go into Maya, uh, cut up and then start to position. In Maya, we're going to assign the texture. So right click and go down to assign new material, select Lambert. Now in the settings and especially the color, go to the checker map and assign the ambient occlusion. So from a file, select the folder icon and navigate to ambient occlusion. Double check that you have this uh, show texture button selected, otherwise you won't be able to preview it. And finally, I want to add the transparency, so also known as opacity. Same method as before, just select the file. So now we've got a texture that's ready to be used. I like to scale it down just so it's uh, almost representative of the size of the head and then potentially give it a name. We're also going to have to adjust the viewports in Maya um, because as we duplicate this, the depth sorting isn't, isn't that good. So go up into uh, Renderer Viewport 2.0, click this little square. And you want to change the transparency algorithm into depth peeling as default will come as object sorting um, and it will give some artifacts. So don't do that. So what we're going to do now is basically cut up this uh, piece of geometry and then I like to duplicate it across and uh, make a bit of a production line. So we're going to get these and give them curves, give them a couple of different variates, variations in the 3D geometry. And then we're going to get those pieces and then cluster them together into assortments of um, hair cluster. And then once those are grouped, you can basically start to use them and position them on the hair. So all the way starting from individual hair in ZBrush, we can duplicate that off, bake it, create these um, flat textures, give them some 3D geometry, maybe give them some curvature, cluster them together and then assign them onto the head. Um, and then because you've potentially done a sculpt already, you can place those clusters within that 
transparent sculpt and give it its original shape. So first I'm going to use the multi-cut tool uh, up here under multi-cut. And while I hold control, I can basically insert edge loops to split these sections off. Um, as we 2D concept it, you can see we're taking advantage of those segments that we had originally put in. If we had some strands of hair that were overlapping this, we'd have to basically cut around it and it would inherently make it very high poly. So once that's done, um, I'll come in and just add some lateral ones down here. So this is going to give the curvature of the hair, almost make it a bit more tubular. So from the side, it's not looking like a flat piece of plane. Um, that's basically unavoidable, but we try our best to hide them as game artists. Next, I'm going to select all the edges on this side uh, and then come to connect. And then with connect with segments selected, I can middle mouse click and drag to insert segments. So that's going to allow the hair to basically curve. I'd um, I put more geometry than is necessary because you can always track back and optimize it later. Uh, the more geometry, the less texture errors you're going to get and the more, less stretching and the no more um, workable the, the mesh is going to be. Once you're happy with those, I just like to uh, select them and then shift right click and then come to extract faces. And then that's going to extract uh, an individual piece. And I'm going to do that for each one. While you're doing that, you can actually press G and that's just going to repeat the last process. So you don't have to keep on going back into the menu. Um, now a feature with these, because they're cut out in the full zone, if you were going to recreate that hair, it's going to update on the UV textures and then update on these models. Um, a downside to that is when you start to put it into a games engine, we do get things uh, such as overdraw. So any of this wasted space that's not cut out is going to be quite taxing on the engine. Um, if you're just starting out, I wouldn't worry about it too much, but it's uh, something to be aware of. Next, I like to take all these and duplicate them, bring them to the side like that production line. We want to reset the pivot point. So up here, I can center the pivot point and then press D to basically position it away where it's going to be easy to manipulate. I like to put it just below the root. Um, that means it can be sort of like cast onto the skull and actually go into the head. Once the pivot points are done, uh, I then like to come in, select the central faces and then just lift them up slightly. And then that's going to give it its curvature from, from different angles. Do that for the rest of them. So I've controlled D and duplicated onto the next stage. Um, with this, we can start to bend. Now, there's loads of ways of doing it. You can use deformers. Um, the organic way I like to do is just come to vertex, select a couple of vertices. Uh, and as you see, it's quite a harsh movement. But if we use something called soft selection, so by pressing B, it's going to give us this nice gradient fall off. So if you hold B and hold click and drag left to right, you can actually change the size of this fall off. So we can make it very, very small. So it's non affecting. What I want is quite a big gradient. So it's going to be nice and smooth transitions for, for long hair. Now this is the fun bit. So at this point you want to make, I'd make quite a few sort of like 12 plus different variations that we can use to make clusters. So you can uh, even size specific bits of it. So they taper off more nicely. And that's why it's important to create straight hair. Um, you can make them twist a little bit. You can increase or change their directions. Uh, a useful thing that I like to do is if we get a straight piece and make the use of deformers, you can come up to deform and then under nonlinear bend, it's going to insert this gizmo. Now you can change the size and scale of the gizmo. I'm just going to rotate it to the side. And then under the attributes editor, you can adjust the curvature. So you could do that for each individual piece. Um, but I found like a little trick that you can do. So once you've got a hair strand that you like, um, you can just select and control D and that's basically going to delete the history. And now we can manipulate that how we like. Uh, now, if, but if we come back to the original, uh, we can change this and change the direction, even move its spawn point. So if I move the spawn point to the pivot point, that means I won't have to adjust it later. Can you see how the pivot point's gone off, off skew? Um, so at this point, you can just create all, all manner of directions for curvature. So you can use that on your clusters. Okay, so the next stage after we've got our, our units that we can use, um, I'm just going to start with something like a, a bulk hair, bring it down and then create clusters that we can use on the hair itself. So I usually like to start with something like this, just duplicate them out a little bit, rotate them and look at them at all angles. Uh, spend a lot of time on this because when we're duplicating it, uh, that's when we're going to see the most advantage, but I'm just going to do this very quickly. 
make sure there is some semblance of um, flow and clumping like you had in the original hairs. So with this, I can just go soft select and then just direct this so it has a nice flow. Looks like they're combining. Uh, you could also use the tactic of rotation. So from different angles, we can hide different parts of the card. Um, so obviously we don't want to see something like a side plane. We can just uh, sort of hide that behind and tuck it in from different angles. And that's fundamentally what makes a good um, hair character artist. So once the first layer is done, I can make use of the other strands that we made. So the thinner strands. So I can duplicate this and I'm just going to place them on top of the originals. And as you'll see, it will start to feather out and look a bit more realistic. So after you've added the second layer, you can obviously use the third layer just to blend it to the background a bit more uh, and then slowly start to build this up. With the third layer, you basically want to hide all these edges. So this is the part of the video where I'd like to congratulate you guys for getting this far. You're definitely in the upper percentage of people who are committed to watching long form videos like this and changing their life with game art. So you guys are the people that I make these videos for and if you find them useful, share them with uh, friends who also share the same passion when it comes to character art. That's a unit of hair we can use on a multitude of things. Um, I again create about 20 of these uh, and then slowly discover which ones work well, and which ones don't. Um, don't worry about this sort of stuff because you can always blend it back in with different forms of hair strands. So that empty space we can use to basically um, blend it back onto the skull. But as you can see, I mean, this would be about 20% of what I'd like to spend some time on, but um, you can make sure it's looking good from every angle. And then when you transfer that onto the character, it's going to look really good. So I'm going to select all these and then control G to group it. So that means that when I select it and press up, it's then going to go to that cluster. I'm going to have to redo the pivot point on the group. So I'm just going to move that. Potentially it would have been an idea to pre-name these so that when you duplicated them, uh, they would be named in increments. And then that means that, you know, you know which one's which part of the texture or which parts is on the UV. So once you've got that, it's a case of, um, you know, having a set of tools that you can use and then bringing it up to the character. Now, I'm not going to do the whole hair, but what I do suggest is to start from the bottom and then start to layer it up. Uh, and at this point, I like to use things like a lattice to connect that back to the head. So if you go deformers and then under lattice, um, you can change the amount of lattice points in there by clicking the, the square next to it. So by default, it comes with about four, I think. But with this grid, you can come to lattice points. And I don't like to make this look pretty. I just look at the hair, select a couple of points and then manipulate it from there. And basically, you can shape this cluster uh, to where you want it so maybe direct it around an ear but fundamentally it's keeping all that time you spent on making it connect nicely um, and i found this to be the best way to basically build up the hair you'll see a lot of um, tutorials out there for like auto generation or these sort of plugins uh, if you ask any sort of like character artist or hair artist who's worth their weight in gold they'll tell you that manual placement is the best so you're going to be placing these uh, and do spend some time and give some love to that. Um, a useful thing you can do at the same time is make sure that you're making use of the layer system in, in um, Maya. So up here, you've got the channel box um, and under here, you've got a layer system. So whenever you've selected, let's say a group of hair that you like, like some sideburns, you can click this button. It's gonna group them all together and create a layer at the same time. And then with that, you can you know hide those individual segments of the hair, whether it's the side or the top, um, you can click this button to see its wireframe or potentially turn it to R. So that means that you're not going to accidentally click on it. So you can complete layers at the bottom, put it into a layer, turn it to R so you can't click it and then continue on top. So it's just about um, progressing and building this up. So a nice thing about this workflow, um, if at this stage you found that one of these hair cards was really annoying or it didn't work so well, or if you look at your main character, and the tips don't look right and you want to make a change, you can go back to any stage of this and make those edits. So for example, if we did some edits here, I would just make adjustments, re-export the high poly. Then when you come 
back to um, substance designer. We want to go to the high polys that you changed. So in this case, 25, and then just reload that high poly, rebake everything, and then it's going to update on the texture. So I'll give you an example of that. So I've made a, an adjustment that should be quite pronounced. Uh, just re-export this, go into substance, uh, right click, and I'm going to reload. Now, when you finish um, or you get to the stage where you're happy with your with sort of like how the hair cards are working, you might want to introduce some anti-aliasing just to up the quality or put it to 4K um, so you can put it into production mode. Uh, but for this, I'm just going to update. So I'm going to start render. And because the high poly is linked in our resources, everything's updated. Now, when we go to Maya, it should have updated. At first, it wouldn't have, but um, when we click it, there's a bit of a bug that's going on. So just open the hyper shader, and then usually when you close it, it should update. Cool. So now the original texture has changed, um, but the structures that we made originally have remained, in remained intact, uh, and also the piece up here. So you can even use this to thin out the hair. Like if it's looking a bit too thick, you can just start to remove strands from the high poly and then basically rebake re it. So before you leave, it's definitely worth checking out some other videos on the channel, uh, more specifically sculpting of the hair, which is the first process before you'd make something like hair cards. Also, there's the 3D Mutiny website where you can sign up and get a free welcome package and basically any future videos that I release privately, um, not on my YouTube channel. Also, there's the Discord, which is growing pretty fast. Um, members are making suggestions on videos and basically talk about the games industry. So thanks for watching and make sure you do all the stuff like subscribing and liking and sharing if you found it useful and think other friends would also find it useful. So bye bye.